Hello, everybody. So we're going to be looking at Chapter 9 here, uh, Economic Transformation, 1820 to 1860. The next couple chapters, we're looking at the same years, uh, looking at different things, different aspects of this early America. So two major themes in this chapter, the Industrial Revolution, the first Industrial Revolution, which is uh, really looking at the growth and the mechanization of industry, as well as the market revolution that goes along with it. Uh, not only is it making all the goods and in industrial factories, it's also selling uh, all the goods as well, and the con cons consumption of all the goods. Uh, these occur, these, this integration of markets, expansion of markets really occurs between 1820 and 1860, resulting in 1860 in America being the third largest uh, manufacturer in the world. Pretty crazy. A hundred years earlier, we were a bunch of little colonies with some thousands of people, uh, a, a little piece of the great British empire. Now, by the 1860, we're the third largest economy on the globe. Pretty amazing, really, if you think about it. Uh, we'll also see how this revolution changes life in the city and the countryside and just generally society as a whole. We'll be looking at those things in this transformation of America. Well, this American Industrial Revolution, and we're doing it about 100 years later than England, for instance. England's Industrial Revolution began, oh, honestly, probably in the 1670s, uh, America, England's Industrial Revolution. So we're a century behind, but we're still one of the earlier countries. Uh, England was first, but we're still one of the first. Well, mass production of goods really allows products that had been luxury products before that can now be used by all. Um, and we're going to see sort of all how all this blends together here. So there's a couple of different parts to this. So mass production of goods as part of the Industrial Revolution is a new thing. There's no assembly line yet. I mean, that comes about in the second Industrial Revolution, 100 years after this or take 80 years after this. Um, but it's still, we start seeing mass production of goods on a smaller scale than an assembly line. Uh, now we see mass produced shoes and mass produced clothes. Uh, not everything is handmade anymore. Uh, we now have a lot of outwork and as a result of that, a division of labor. All right, so we're gonna be using Lynn, Massachusetts here as an example. In Massachusetts, we're going to be looking at the shoe industry as an example here. Now, the way shoes, the first mass production began is women, it typically was women doing this because the men were doing the farming. Women would sit at home with their daughters and their children, and they would make pieces, sometimes referred to as piecework. Uh, this is also referred to as a cottage industry because the first mass production of goods was paper I made it at home. So it was like they were making it in their cottage. So all these are really tied together. This is a, a general term for this cottage industry. It was called piecework because you're making individual pieces. And also the outwork, because instead of working in a factory, you're working out of the factory in your home. And what they would do for shoes, for instance, is they would make pieces of shoes. Uh, they wouldn't make a whole shoe. They might just make the sole or just make laces, for instance. And then a traveling uh, businessman would come by and pick up their goods, pick up their pieces, uh, pick up their, their parts, and then take it to a central location. And then in a central location, there would be a couple other women working, and the women would then put everything together. So groups of women sitting at home would make all the different parts, and then a group of women at a house somewhere would put them all together. And this is a division of labor because now what we find is instead of one person making a whole pair of shoes, you literally have six different women uh, making pieces and then a seventh woman putting them all together. Uh, this is actually greatly speeds the production. Uh, instead of making a couple pairs of shoes, they could gather all the supplies and they could make hundreds of shoes in a couple of days. Uh, it makes the the product more generic too. In this time period, you could buy three sizes of shoes, small, medium, large, and they had them for men, women, and kids. 
So there wasn't this, this a way you could buy individual shoe sizes that didn't exist. If you wanted that, you had to get a handcrafted pair of shoes, which was far more expensive. Another thing this does is it makes it much cheaper. Ultimately, when they're able to produce these hundreds and then thousands of shoes like this using division of labor and outwork, uh, it's much cheaper. Plus, another aspect is the workforce itself. We have women doing the work. Most products were made by men up to this point in time. Um, uh, so we have women doing it. And why is that really significant? One, it greatly increases the workforce. We now have a lot more people working than we ever had before because women didn't typically work outside the home. And even if they are sitting at home doing this, it's still sort of a form of, of working outside the home, this outwork system. Uh, uh, and the last aspect of this was the, the, pr the price of the labor. They could pay women literally, literally pennies. So they'd work all day long and for every piece they would make, they might get like a penny or two pennies or something. It was still money they were generating, but it was really cheap. So you have really cheap labor, you have a much expanded labor force and this mass production of goods. It drastically reduces the price of products. Now even common poor people can buy a new pair of shoes or a new dress because this applied to the entire textile industry. Whether it was shoes, belts, clothes, dresses, pants, whatever, shirts. And Lynn, Massachusetts is really where this begins. Um, let's see if I left anything else. As I said, uh, wages are really low, really cheap labor. Um, another thing it does is it reduces the number of skilled laborers. This actually puts some men out of work because an actual cobbler, a cobbler is a person who makes shoes, so you have an actual cobbler who handcrafts shoes, can't do it anymore. Not the way he used to do it. Because now no one's coming to him to buy shoes because they can buy these mass produced factory shoes. Um, uh, now the cobbler, the only way he can really stay in business is to focus on much more of an elite crowd. He would have to focus on more of the upper class, people who can afford handcrafted shoes, which is not the mass of the population. So there's a lot of changes between cheaper labor, between increased production, lower cost to consumers, uh, decreasing need for skilled workers, an increased need for unskilled workers, lots of aspects to this, lots of advantages and disadvantages to the system. What should be noted is this is the way of the future. So whether there's good and bad, it should be understood this is the way we're going and we're not going to stop. Um, and we still have not stopped to today. Uh, so. Even with the disadvantages, it was progress, quote unquote progress. All right. Well, the places where the women actually sat and put everything together, the central locations where you'd have a handful of women that would put all the pieces together, eventually the owners of these factories got the idea just to bring all the women there. Just bring everybody here. Instead of going around and collecting all the pieces from all the different local farms and communities as they did for years, what about having everybody simply come to the same location and then having them all doing it all in the same place? Uh, now, this takes time because one of the biggest issues is women did not work in the public. Women were always stuck in the private sphere. So they got to find a way to make it OK for women who are in the private, at home, sheltered, watched over by their husbands and their sons, uh, and women didn't generally be out in the public. Now you have to find a way to get them to relocate from the public to, pardon me, from the private to the public. Um, so this is a process. It's a process to get these factories to do this. Now, the very first factories were for things you couldn't make at home. Cincinnati system, for instance, this has to do with um, uh, production of meat, slaughterhouses. So the very first factories were for products that you couldn't do in piecework. You can't really do the slaughtering of cattle in piecework in your living room. So that's where it begins. And that's where people get the idea that, hey, let's just have everybody in one central location. And eventually the textile industry, the shoe industry, all, all moves to the factory system. So the Cincinnati system was really our first factories. Uh, these were uh, producing, slaughtering cattle. And they really became really efficient at it. Uh, 60 cows an hour. Finally, they, they get all the way up to 60 cows an hour and 334 cows a year in the Cincinnati system in 
Um, don't quote me on it, but I think I would assume Cincinnati, Ohio, right? Uh, they're producing and slaughtering. This isn't just in one single factory necessarily, but in the system uh, in Cincinnati, 60 an hour, 334,000 a year. Uh, pretty impressive. Pretty quickly how they were doing it. And it had to be pretty ugly. Well, there's other things that tie into this as well. Uh, this is a division of labor too. Because in the factory, another thing which really expedited the process is people would be trained to do one thing all day long. And so your job all day long would be to uh, hang the cattle, hang the cow up after killing it up on a, on a chain system and the chain would run through the factory with the cow hanging on it. And that's all you did all day long was hang the cows up on the chains. Or your other job, your, your other person might be his entire job all day long is just to slice the cow open and bleed it. And that's all he did all day long. So this also contributes to the de-skilling of labor. Uh, you don't need to be a skilled meat cutter or meat processor just to slice a cow open and bleed it. And that's all you do all day. Um, or to hit the cow in the head and kill it. Uh, whatever, however they, they did it. So this also has a division of labor to where you are not producing and slaughtering the whole cow. You're just doing your one little piece. You're dividing the labor up among different steps. And you're just doing your one piece. Another of the first factories was the wheat system. Uh, wheat, we don't have a specific name for it, but the production of wheat um, in America. Water power was used in the 1780s. Natural water power, water wheels. They would actually, you've seen them, they'd actually build these water wheels in rivers and the water, the river would just run, it would turn the wheel and that turning wheel would be translated into motion inside the factory that would actually crush the grain and make the wheat and um, the flour and everything. Uh, and occasionally blew up. <laughs> Odd how that would happen. I can't go into it, explain it, but occasionally these little wheat factories would go boom. <laughs> Not good if you were inside, I suppose. Um, anyway, uh, and this really increases the production of wheat uh, about 10 times more than an animal powered mill. So pre previously, literally, it was a cow that would just walk around in a circle all day long. A cow or an ox or whatever, just walk around in a circle all day long, turning the grinder, grinding the wheat. Now the water wheel increases it 10 times, uh, increases the production 10 times. Then by the 1830s, they start using fossil fuels. They start using coal, for instance, instead of water, which increased the production by several times again. Coal fired uh, production, allowing to, to move uh, machines. And, and it's really coal power, but it's actually water power. It's, it's, it's steam power is really what it is. Uh, we, we've heard of steam engines. Well, the steam really, what actually creates a steam engine is the coal heating the water and the heated water produces steam. And then the steam is actually used to fun, to make the machines move, uh, the steam pistons and whatnot. But you have to have the coal to heat the water to make the steam. That's the way that works. Um, another one is McCormick's Reaper. McCormick's Reaper, and I think I have a photo of it. And I'll come back to there. Yeah, this is a Reaper. Here's an idea what this is. It is a machine that would be pulled across the field by horses. You'd have a couple of men working on the machine if necessary, uh, driving the horses and doing repairs. And then you have all these letters. Uh, some of the things we'll talk about, interchangeable parts, replaceable parts. Previous to this generation, if you had something break, you had to have it repaired. The whole thing had to be repaired, take it to a blacksmith to get something fixed. Now, with this mass production in factories, they mass produce these replacement parts. So if something breaks, you simply order a new A, or you call the factory and order a new K, or a new N, or a new M, and that's all you do. And you can replace it right there yourself out in the field. And of course, if you are prepared, you would already have replacement parts sitting in your barn, expecting when A might break or M might break. So when you order the Reaper, you order replacement parts. So your, your production never has to stop. The Reaper does another very significant thing too. The Reaper did the work of about 10 men. So now you have one man working the Reaper right here on the horse, what had been 10 men before. You have another guy here, but he only has to come in to repair it, maybe. So you're talking about, and this is one of the things that contributes to industrialization and contributes to factory work. Now you have machines doing the work of several men. What do those men do? They've lost their jobs. So where do they go? They go to work in the factories doing the production that we're talking about, that we were just talking about. 
So I mentioned women doing much of the textile work. Well, there's a ton of other things produced in the factories. While the women seem to be focused primarily on doing uh, things to do with clothing and textiles, men would be working in all other kinds of factories, making all other kinds of things. And usually where the men came from was they were pushed off the farms. They were no longer needed to work the farm because we now had reapers doing the work of the men. And now the men are freed up to go work in the factories to make replacement parts for the reaper. Uh, being replaced by machines to even 200 years ago. We talk about that today. It's been going on for a long time. All right. Uh, the McCormick's Reaper. Uh, the McCormick's Reaper used an assembly line and a conveyor belt. They used a conveyor belt to actually pull the parts along and to build the Reapers. And of course, this does begin the process of machines replacing men two centuries ago. Earlier than probably a lot of people thought, uh, really, who've really looked at this, uh, if you just haven't really studied it, uh, machines have been replacing men since, and really, if you want to go to England, since the early 1700s, for 300 years, they've been using machines to replace men. One of the reasons immigrants come here, one of the reasons I gave you before was the mass industrialization in Europe of uh, the commercialization of agriculture as a result of things like this is one of the things that freed up so many men looking for work and looking for jobs and looking for land. And guess what? Hey, there's this great place in America where the whole continent's open. All you have to do is go and take the land and you can build your own farm. You could thank the Reaper and other things like that for that. This shows you what was being produced in America and it shows you what had the most value. Look at this for a moment and look and see what you think is the most valuable product on here. You have product in millions. So the most valuable product seems pretty obvious, flour and meal that has the largest bar here. So that's what was producing the most money, food. Everybody has to eat. Um, what has the most value per worker? What actually has the most value per worker? That's right here, number 10, liquor. $1,770 value added per worker. Wow, uh, alcohol, big business. Uh, alcohol, big business. Who had the most workers? Well, that's a bit of a trick question because I'm not talking about, I'm, I'm talking about industry. What industry had the most workers? Look for a moment. Textile industry. You have textiles here, number one. Textiles, number three. Textiles, number five. Textiles, number eight. Textiles, number nine. All those are textile industries. All those are clothing industries. Uh, big money, a lot of people involved, a lot of people involved in this. Number of workers, 115,000 in cotton, 123,000 making boots and shoes. Wow. I guess Americans went through a lot of shoes, huh? Men's clothing, 115,000. Not surprising right there. Men's clothing, men are the ones doing most of the work in the labor, labor force. Anyway, it gives you an idea of what we're producing in all these factories. Uh, clothing, goods, machinery, iron goods, flour and meal, lumber production. We need lumber production because we, of course, we're an expanding America, constantly building new homes and new businesses as we moved across the West. So we needed lumber production on a large scale, really did. Um, we have McCormick's Reaper here. I think I've covered that. I don't think I want to add anything else to that. So let's go on and look at the textile industry specifically and look at the competition with England. Now, why is that important? Well, England was the largest textile producer in the world. So they controlled the textile industry. Well, until we came along. So England feared competition with us. Uh, or, or they really feared competition with the US. They even got to the point where they made it illegal to export any type of textile technology, building factories, building machines, any type of production processes. It was actually against the law to transport any type of technology or the people. The people who knew how to do the technology also was illegal for them to even leave England and migrate to America. I mean, I don't know what they're gonna do once you're in America, they're gonna send the police after you exactly, but they would try to keep you from leaving the country. Um, deny you travel privileges, etc. Uh, the mechanics were one of the biggest problems. The term we would use today would be engineer. 
back then they called them mechanics. And these mechanics, they wanted to keep them in England because they're the ones that knew how to build the machines. They're the ones that knew how to design, build, repair, run the machines. They were inventors, they were engineers, many of them self-taught, and they wanted them to stay um, because they wanted to hold on to their control of the worldwide. And this wasn't just England, America. England controlled the textile industry on the globe, worldwide. They had textile mills in India, they had textile mills in America, they had textile mills in Asia, China. They were, they controlled the industry globally. Um, so hundreds still come over, of course. I mean, you can't, you just can't stop them. Uh, we have pretty much in this time period, open borders. Uh, almost anyone, if you can afford the passage on a ship, you can get on a ship and go almost anywhere you want. It's really very, very open environment globally. You can go about any place you want. I mean, you risk your life if you go some places. I mean, you might literally get there and be killed or enslaved, but um, it was open. It was generally open to go anywhere you wanted. Samuel Slater in 1789, he built a cotton mill in Rhode Island. He built a cotton mill in Rhode Island. Uh, he copied it off of a British. He was one of these mechanics. He's often credited with actually beginning the American Industrial Revolution. Beginning the American Industrial Revolution because he built the first cotton mill um, and he created the first machines to really separate cotton, which is really tough to do, uh, from the plant to put it in an actual workable fashion so you can manufacture clothes out of it. It's really time consuming. Well, England had a lot of advantages over us, all kinds of advantages. First of all, they already controlled the industry. They had a vast cheap labor force, much more than we did. Millions and millions of, of poor people due to the agricultural commercialization in Europe. You find hundreds of thousands and millions, really, of cheap labor men and women. Uh, England had already done this. England went to the Industrial Revolution 100 years before us. England had a vast shipping network. They had thousands of ships to transport their goods and materials all around the world. Uh, very low interest rates. Honestly, they had every advantage. How would we ever be com com competitive with them? Well, they had a few of our own advantages. We typically took the stuff from them that we, um, oh, let's just use the right word, we stole. A lot of this technology we simply stole from them. Today we would use the term industrial espionage. That's really what it is. Uh, a lot of this technology we stole from them, copied from them. Um, we then took it, we improved it using the engineers we got from them uh, in other European countries. Uh, and we built bigger and better machines. We also had a vast untapped uh, workforce in America, women and children, to be honest. We see a lot of children moving into the workforce here too, and especially in the textile industry. So a vast untapped workforce of women and children, incredibly cheap labor. Uh, we could pay women almost, as I said, basically pennies, uh, pay the women almost nothing, very low wages. Um, yeah. So women and children are employed in these textile factories, especially in the Northeast. That really becomes the textile center of America. You'll see it on the map in a second. The Northeast region, uh, up around Massachusetts, really becomes this center. Uh, cloth making, and this is when they start. They get the idea from the Cincinnati system. They get the idea from other factories that they take all that piecework and that whole cottage system, and they get the idea to move it all under one roof uh, to make it much more effective. And the sort of the uh, epicenter of this is Lowell, Massachusetts. And in Lowell, Massachusetts, they develop what they call the Waltham Plan. And the Waltham Plan is a way to draw young girls and women away from the farms into the factories. It's a system which should allow, it's a way to convince the parents to allow their daughters to leave home and go and work and make, make goods instead of staying home. And they do this by creating a very enticing system. They offer at these, these are, these are basically boarding schools slash factories slash workhouses. Uh, well, okay, we'll just say, we'll just, just, just keep it simple. We'll say factory slash boarding schools. Um, uh, they would have cultural events. They would have moral instruction. 
religious services, very strict rules, uh, curfews, um, uh, dietary plans. They would have chaperones if they would ever leave the boarding school slash factory. And a portion of their wages would be sent back to the family. So mom and dad would in essence send off their girls for a sort of a quasi education while becoming slave labor in a workforce. And it really was that bad. The, the stories from this are horrific. Uh, these girls really weren't there getting all the things they were promised. They were primarily being used as forced labor. They couldn't leave, they were under contract. Their parents signed away, basically the parents signed them away until they were adults. Um, it's really indentured servitude. Uh, they did get a little bit of training, a little education, a little bit of religious services, cultural and moral instruction, but they were primarily there to slave away in factories to produce textile goods for almost nothing. Their parents would get like a dollar or two dollars a week or something. And the girls got, uh, the girls got paid very little. They did get a little bit of pay though, a little bit. So are the women an advantage in here? If they survive, and I'm not saying there was high mortality rates or anything, they didn't abuse them or, or kill them or anything, but when the, whenever the girl would leave one of these factories, they would have a little bit of money, a little bit of independence. They could on the weekends, on a Saturday or Sunday, they could actually leave and go to a local town. Um, they could even maybe have a relationship, maybe. So was this advantageous for these young girls? For some, yes. Some got a little money, a little independence compared to living their whole life uh, isolated on a farm. And having, uh, as was the commonly back then, which was still pretty common, having your uh, marriage chosen for you, having your partner chosen for you, arranged marriages. So, yeah, it's hard to say. We have the center up here. This is a number of spindles. What's a spindle? Spindle is literally something that spins, and it takes like a mass of cotton, and it spins it into a thread. Spins it into a thread. And so every spindle can run, well, if it's, if it's an efficient factory, that spindle will run 24-7. So look at a number of spindles. Just up in the Massachusetts region, you have two areas here. One of these is Lowell. Up to 500,000 spindles in one location. Some of these factories had hundreds and hundreds of spindles with hundreds and hundreds of girls all day long, just spinning thread. Eventually, they, they industrialize and mechanize all this and make machines out of it. So we have big machines that are water run or coal driven, which have thousands of spindles and single factories. Still requires lots of women to work and maintain and do other things um, other than just spinning the thread. So up here, lots of spindles. And you have some down here in the south too. But this was the center of the textile industry. How big does it become? Well, by 1860, we actually start to overtake England. So England, which had a 100-year advantage on us, all the other advantages, it takes us two generations, and we start to actually overtake England. Um, the Really, the thing holding us back wasn't the production of the textiles. What was holding us back was the merchant fleet. We just didn't have the ships. England had a 200-year head start on us there, so we didn't really have the ships to, do all the, to, to really do all the production and sales uh, across the ocean. But yeah. Um, we were catching up. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of spindles producing all these textiles that were then turned into clothing and other things. All right, we'll move on to the next section. So by the 1820s, mechanics were developing innovative factory technologies. Um, most of them were not formally educated, but very skillful. An example of some of these mechanics are the Sellers family. Sellers family was in Pennsylvania. They developed a machine to twist wool and yarn. Uh, they later, later develop machines to build uh, wire sieves, machines to build fire hoses, uh, machines to uh, make paper making equipment, to uh, make paper making machines. Uh, they, even, they even build locomotives. So quite impressive. Um, 
these were the really the people who built our industrial revolution most of them self-taught entrepreneurs um just using their intelligence to develop new technologies. America was a land of opportunity if you're willing to work and, and take risks. They founded the Franklin Institute, named after Ben Franklin, you know, one of America's first uh, inventors. The Franklin Institute for Instruction in Chemistry, Math, Mechanical Design. They had a journal, they had exhibits. Uh, this gives you an example of just what was happening in America, how we managed to catch up and overtake most of the rest of the world in such a short period of time, how we really came to dominate uh, manufacturing, at least the third largest manufacturer in the world by 1860. Machine tools specifically was where we made parts for other machines. So a machine tooled machine would it was machines building parts for other machines. Pretty ingenious. Um, Eli Whitney was one of the leaders in this technology. Eli Whitney, he studied at Yale. He developed the cotton gin. The gin was a short term, a slang term for machine. So the cotton machine, cotton gin. Uh, he developed this from technology he, he made to make women's hairpins. What does the cotton gin do? It's most simple. The cotton gin is literally just these, these metal fingers that pull the cotton apart and separate it from uh, the plant parts. Very time consuming, very difficult, uh, bloody work actually. The, the, the adult mature cotton when it's picked, the, the seed that cracks open, it's almost sharp as a razor, sharp as a needle. Um, so pulling all this apart was incredibly time consuming and painful and labor intensive. He developed a machine that could do that to produce this cotton. Uh, later, Whitney built other machine tools to make interchangeable musket parts. Uh, muskets, the rifle of the time, the gun of the time, interchangeable musket parts. Uh, previously, for musket broke, you had to take it to a craftsman to actually have it fixed. Now, when you are learn how to use a musket, you actually learn how to replace the parts. Uh, tear a musket down and replace pieces to it. So you simply carry replacement parts with you when you're out there uh, in the field or whatever it is you're doing, hunting or military. We see all kinds of other technological innovations uh, sweeping America, all kinds of new inventions, lathes, planers. These are all things about wood production. Uh, rifle parts, of course, sewing, sewing machines, boring machines, um, something actually bores into, drills holes. Pretty amazing, this technology. We really start using standardized machine parts. And the reason that is, uh, today, if you've ever done any type of construction, you're used to using standardized parts, nails, screws, bolts. When you go to the store and you need to fix something, you need a number seven bolt or whatever, or a number six screw. Or if you need wood to build something, you buy it, you get a two by four, two by six, two by eight. You don't just go and measure some random size of wood you need to build something and go to the store and say, I need a board that is seven and three quarters inches by six and two thirds inches. I mean, you can do that if you really have a specialty project, but 99% of the time you go to the store and you simply buy uh, standardized sizes of wood if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's. And that's the way it is. Uh, construction projects and maintenance projects now have standardized. So everything, everything you buy has a size number a size or a uh, something like that. So this becomes common in this time period. And the reason is so they're interchangeable so that you can simply fix something and replace it yourself without having to call a specialist. Many people do that in their cars. People change their own oil. You go buy a certain size oil filter, certain size air filter, certain types of spark plugs. Everything today is interchangeable parts. Most things you can repair yourself, most things. It's really odd, but in a way, we're actually moving away from that due to technology becoming so complicated now, especially electronics technology, computers, phones. You know, many phones now you can't even open up. The first phones that, that I was used to, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you could open up, you could replace, you could change out things, you could, you could change out batteries, change out parts of the phone. Computers were designed back in the 19, uh, 1990s. 
to where you could simply crack them open and replace a disk drive, replace a hard drive. You could upgrade it to the next size uh, processor. Now, no. Now, most of that stuff you can't do. Most of that they recommend don't do it yourself because the technology is getting too advanced. And of course, it's a way for them to make more money to make you do that. Uh, so in a way, with technology, we're actually moving away from interchangeable parts. However, I would gather in construction and industrial field, it's still that way. You, you still go and buy that stuff. Um, really interesting. We start to dominate European markets, and America becomes a real player on the global markets of interchangeable, replaceable parts. We start selling all kinds of technology and parts and products to Europe, to, uh, to Asia. It really helps us becoming a lead uh, manufacturer. Now, this would be a really good discussion question of woodworker here. This was a skilled laborer. How would his life have changed with this industrial revolution? You can look at what he's got there in his hands and probably guess what he does. Uh, I'll give you a hint there. He's got a mallet and a chisel. And what do you use a chisel on? Um, yes, there's, you might say, it could be a stone worker. You would use a chisel there, but that's very unusual to have a stone worker. He would have been a woodworker. Uh, oh, it even says it on the bottom. Uh, a woodworker down there, circa 1850. So what would be the changes to his life going from a skilled worker in this new industrial revolution? And the question is, why do you take this photo? That is also significant. A photograph? Photo, photos are brand new technology. So what does that say about him? The way he's dressed? Why is he holding his chisel and mallet? Why? I mean, if he, photos say a thousand things. They, they say those a thousand words. The fact that he took the photo holding that chisel and mallet dressed like he is, is very purposeful. So what is he trying to say? How has his life changed? What's the significance of holding the tools? And if his life didn't change, what would he have had to change to keep doing the same type of work with mass production, including mass production of wood products? We now can get mass produce cabinets, for instance, mass produce hutches and tables in factories. So you don't need a skilled woodworker to make you a table or chairs or a cabinet. You can buy it out of a, uh, a catalog now. So think about that. Think about all the, all the, all the things affecting this guy uh, in 1850 and how things changed or didn't change what he would have to do. Um, transportation revolution, really significant. Look at the changes here. Look how things change and move here. This is 1820 to 1850. And these are the roads that exist, major roads. There's only a handful of them, the red lines. We see these canals. These are all man-made waterways. The blue lines are navigable rivers, meaning rivers that are big enough to send ships down, barges. So they add canals where the ships, where they can't get the ships to connect the major cities. And then, of course, we have large rivers here and transportation. Look how much it changes by the 1860s. Look at this. We see this change of the green lines here in the 1850s. And by 1860s, all the red lines. This is just railroads here. So between the increase in production here, this all directly ties to Industrial Revolution. The reason to increase all these roads isn't for people traveling. The reason to have all these canals connecting the cities is not for leisure fishing or yachting or transportation even of people. It's for transportation of goods and products. And this is a credible investment. Building all these roads, canals, all these bridges, these waterways, improving all these rivers. They would have to dredge out a lot of the rivers, which means they would have to load, they would have to dredge the bottom to increase the depth of it. So the heavier, bigger boats, because the heavier boat is, the farther it, it sinks into the water. Um, all the investment in all these railroads, building all these railroads. I mean, this is an increase here of almost 10 times more railroads. Why? It has solely it's tied to the Industrial Revolution, uh, the transport of goods and products, uh, manufacture goods, raw materials. Uh, there's a whole section in your book on pretty much the transportation revolution. This is all I'm going to talk about for it here. It's significant. It's huge. But you just need to be aware of what we're looking at here and how much America changes as a result of this Industrial Revolution. Look how people move, too. 
In the 1830s and 40s, we're filling up this area here, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio region. This is where people are moving, and this is where people are moving in the south into the slave society. These are new slave plantations. By 1850 to 62, look where people are going. This is now full. The reason people aren't moving here, it's all full. Population, again, all, all the population is full. So people are going west because of the cheap land. Here, if you're going into places that are highly populated, you can still find empty land, but it's much more expensive. Out here, the land is still really cheap. This is the frontier, uh, the Wild West, if you will. Also see something else interesting. By the 50s and 60s, we see low population movement down here. That is the reason. The reason for that is all of this is slave plantations. So to move down here, you really need to be willing to buy into the slave society. Either you need to have the money to buy into the slave society, to actually own slaves and have a farm or plantation, or you have to be okay being a dirt poor white person working in a, in a society where the only other dirt poor people doing the same job you're doing are slaves. And it should be noted, if you were a poor white farmer, the life you had was not much different than a slave. No, you didn't get beaten, but truth be told, most slaves didn't get beaten either. Um, abused, exploited, of course, and their slaves, but physical abuse of slaves was actually uh, probably less than 20%. Uh, and that's all they needed, of course, to abuse the 20% to set an example for all the rest. That was the reason. Uh, so the common life of a poor white farmer was not much different than a poor black farmer, whether you were slave or not. Uh, poor, poor quality of food, poor quality of clothing, poor quality of housing, uh, working all day long um, was a really miserable life. So if you chose to move to this society down here and you couldn't own slaves, then you would have been relegated to being a poor farmer working e in many ways equal to slaves. And a lot of whites were not okay with that. Plus the increasing pressure, especially in Congress, to stop, to sort of slow down or stop the expansion of slavery means much of this is still unorganized territory, as it says here. Uh, and since slavery was generally outlawed in the North before 1850, even after 1850, this was really the only places you could have slavery, and they weren't adding new territory. The last slave territory that was added was Texas, and Texas had just been added, and there weren't a lot of people moving there yet. It's interesting. Uh, this gives you an idea of specialized. Uh, I'm not going to worry about the specialized. Just look at where the light blue areas are. This is basically where industrialization occurred in America. All along New England, down to Washington and um, uh, New York in here, out to Albany, the capital of New York there. The Great Lakes, Lake Ontario, Lake Erie here. And then around the Ohio River Valley, which will be Louisville, Cincinnati, over to, well, Chicago is actually not included in this. I, I don't know. Um, Chicago is not included in 1840. Chicago really explodes after the Civil War, the, the population explosion in Chicago after the 1860s. But anyway, you can see where the industrialized parts of America are, just where most people live as well, most factories are, and most production is. All right, let's look at the new social classes and culture. So before the Industrial Rev Revolution, most people were considered by rank. Uh, people were either a notable family, upper class educated with money and power, or you were the lower order. That's eh, everybody else. It's all the rest of us, all the common people. Um, most commoners are not educated or minimal education. So you were either notable or a commoner. And notables were probably less than 10%, 15%. In rural areas, everybody shared a very common culture, common religion. Everybody was primarily Protestant Christian of some sort. Now, there's lots of versions of Protestant Christian. There's Baptist, and there's Puritan, there's Congregational, there's, you know, there's Presbyterian, and there's all different types of versions of Protestant faith. But just about everybody was Protestant, the vast majority. People shared a very common culture, discussing crop yields, women discussing quilting, uh, a lot of things that were really, regardless of economic 
situation. When you went to the tavern, you went to the local pub, you might be sitting there drinking next to the richest man in town. Truthfully, he wouldn't be dressed much different than you. Very similar clothing, probably a little higher quality. His shoes might be handcrafted. Yours might have come from a factory. But still, you sat next to each other having a drink. That was the way it was before the Industrial Revolution. Everybody knew everybody. And you didn't have to display or flaunt your wealth. If you lived in a small town, everyone knew you were the richest man in town, richest family in town. Everyone knew it. You didn't have to go around proclaiming it, displaying it, or acting like it. Matter of fact, it would have been very, uh, it would have been very improper to go around acting like you were rich and wealthy. Um, everyone knew. That was before the revolution. They all went to the same church. After 1820s, everything changes. After the 1820s with the Industrial Revolution and this large flooding in of wealth, we see the two social classes really move apart. And we start having more and more rich and wealthy people and a much larger class of poor factory workers and farm workers. So society really de develops into these three different classes. The very rich industrial commercial elite, a very substantial middle class, and then the mass of propertyless wage earners, people with no property, no real status or wealth. Now, where do all the notable families fit in? They actually become the middle class because all this money and wealth from industrialization usually is going into the hands of entrepreneurs and businessmen. So we have what had been the upper class actually getting moved down. Don't get me wrong, they're still nice and comfortable. I mean, they still have servants. I mean, they're still well off. But we have a new, a large business economic elite at the top, which are literally just rich and wealthy from business prospects and all these new factories and industrialization and trade. Um, so the two classes get down a notch and we have this new class on top. So industrialization changes the social order in every way, changes this completely, creates new classes, creates new cultures. We also see a very distinct change between urban and rural life. Um, where most of the wealth was, was in the cities. And 10% of the population owned 70% of all the wealth. You know how it is in America today. You know how terrible it is in America today. How much wealth has gone into the hands of big corporations and wealthy people. In America today, 1% of the population own 90% of all the wealth in our country. It's really sad to be honest. In many ways, it doesn't seem like an, a fair democracy. It doesn't seem like a fair and equitable system. Hey, you know, it's not. 1% owning the 90%, that is, it's really crazy, frankly. Well, it was even bad back then, 10% owning 70% of everything. Uh, they were not just wealthy, they were absurdly, extremely wealthy. More money, more money than they could spend in 10 lifetimes. Incredible amount of money. This was, by the way, this 10%, 70% was 1860, to put a date on it, 1860. Uh, taxes were mostly paid by consumers on products. There was no, was really no income tax. There was very limited property tax. There was almost no business tax. Uh, there was no inheritance tax. So in essence, who owns the businesses, the rich? Who owns the land, the rich? Who passes on their wealth to their kids, the rich? So in essence, there was almost zero tax on the rich, whether it was land, business, inheritance, pretty much no tax. So almost all taxes were paid by excise taxes. What's an excise tax? Well, it's what you pay every single day, it's called sales tax. And who buys all these products? We do, regular people. Uh, we pay in America, typically most, most areas around 8%. So when you go to the store, buy something a dollar, you pay a dollar eight for it. You pay about 8% sales tax. That's pretty standard. Well, that means 8% of your entire wealth, 8% of all the money you generate, and this doesn't even include where you pay other taxes. 8% of all of your money you generate, therefore, gets paid in taxes. Well, if you're poor, 8% of your wealth is a lot of money. 8% can make the difference between feeding your children this week or, or having food on the table tonight or whether it's just a piece of bread or two pieces of bread. So 8% of your wealth is a very significant chunk of your disposable income. If you're rich, 
Does 8% of your wealth affect you? It means nothing. If you're rich, you, if you lose 8% of your wealth, you don't even notice it. So you pay your sales taxes and it means nothing to you. So the poor pay sales tax and it means the difference between feeding, your, feeding their kids. They only have enough food to feed two of their kids, not three of their kids. So it is a tax on the poor. Sales tax is a tax on the poor. It's terrible. It, it's, it's a terrible thing today. We're one of the only countries in the world that has one, by the way. In modern times, most countries do not have sales tax. Uh, an industrial uh, if you go to the store and it's a dollar on the shelf in most parts of the world you pay a dollar you don't pay a dollar eight so it is a poor tax and so most taxes are paid by the poor in this time period uh, today that's not the case most taxes are not paid by the poor however still poor do pay a significant portion of their income to to uh, excise taxes still it's still a tax on the poor um uh, excise income corporate i just covered all that so upper class also tried to distinguish themselves. They would dress differently. They would look different. They would uh, wear finer clothes. They would now have servants in public. That would have been very inappropriate before. Even if you had a maid or a servant or something at your home, if you were part of the notable family, you didn't carry them around in public. In public, you still opened your own doors. You still rode your own horse. Uh, you still went out and you, if you went shopping, you would carry your own stuff. It would have been inappropriate to do that. Now, by the 1860s, that's what you did. You had to display your wealth. You had to ride around with servants. You had to ride around with someone taking care of your horse, taking care of your wagon and your carriage. You had to have someone carry your stuff when you went somewhere. Um, yeah. So that would have also been very inappropriate before. Now it becomes standard place. So things really change. And by 1860, pretty much all urban areas are socially and economically stratified by both race and ethnicity, which isn't really what I'm talking about here, although it, it is the case, but also by economics. Um, this race, class, ethnicity, and economics, pretty much all aspects of city life. Now, if you still live out in the rural farm, not a lot has changed. But the cities are now getting hundreds of thousands and even millions of people. So they start to become a real significant part of American society. The middle class, who were they? These used to be the notables. This used to be the notables, the regular business owners, the shop owners, the general store owners, the, the, uh, the mechanic shop, the land surveyors, the doctors, the lawyers. These used to be the upper class. Now they're the middle class. Now they are the middle class. Uh, the notables are now the middle class folks. Um, most of these live in the Northeast, not much in the South. Uh, not that much in the South. Um, the South is still mostly notable families and poor, uh, mostly poor. So the cost of consumer goods does become much cheaper. With industrialization and mass production, we get cheaper goods, which actually increases the standard of living. People are not making more money. However, because goods are cheaper, that means they end up having more money in their pocket because they're having to spend less of their money on daily, everyday goods, the staples of life. So they end up having more income available to purchase other things. So standard of living increases, even though wages don't really increase uh, due to mass production and industrialization. Matter of fact, some places wages drop due to the descaling of labor. The fact that everyone is doing this division of labor now, which means, like I said, no person, very few people know how to make a pair of shoes, but they all know how to work in the factories, the shoe factory. So they actually make less money in some cases. Um, uh, let's see. You often were concerned about, you were certainly concerned about taking care of your family. You wanted to provide your family with a comfortable home, transportation, clothing. Now you can actually save some money. We see the number of, in, of investments in banks. Um, that's the wrong word for the way to put it. Savings. We see the amount of savings in banks in this industrial revolution increase almost a hundred times. Almost a hundred time increase in bank savings in this time period. Uh, becoming a banker is now a good career move. Where previously banking was for a very, very small elite group of people because almost no one had money to put in banks unless you were really rich. Now. There's a whole slew of middle class people that have excess money they can put away in banks. So banking becomes a real industry in America.
Uh, leisure also becomes an industry. You know, I have extra time to spend on leisure activities. You have extra money available to to spend on leisure activities, to purchase goods for leisure activities. Um, work doesn't necessarily control your entire life. Previously, work was everything. If you were in a rural economy, you got up in the morning and you worked all day long until at night when it was dark. No matter what your job was, work was all day. That was simply the way it was. Whether you sat at a desk or whether you worked on the farm, that was simply the way of life. 60-hour work week was the standard. Now people have not have to work as much because they make more money. They could work less. Now, if you're poor, you're poor. You still got to work a lot. We're really talking about the middle class here. Some more time for leisure. Uh, upper middle class people um, would probably have women uh, not work at all. Uh, middle class didn't have a lot of women working. But upper middle class certainly didn't have women working. The men provided everything. Uh, you have a lot more time for personal improvement. This is really expectation of middle class in America now. You're supposed to have culture. You're supposed to read books, learn to play musical instruments, decorate the home, uh, get a better education. You're supposed to improve yourself through moral and mental discipline, culture, uh, music, um, art, learn to paint. Remember, this used to be the upper class. Now they're the middle class. So they have to find ways to distinguish themselves from the common man. It becomes important before. Before they were the upper class, everybody knew it. Now there's a whole nother class above them. They're really rich. So they have to find ways to distinguish themselves of the middle class from the poor working class. Uh, they have to find a way to distance themselves. And culture and education is two of the most significant ways to do this. To really, you know, carnivals, going to festivals, having parties, having salons, uh, and of course, getting some type of education, even for girls, even even getting your daughters educated become part of this. Even though the women rarely had an opportunity to use that education because the standard for a woman was to get married and have a family, uh, still we see increasing numbers of women getting an education among the upper classes, at least. All right, now, um, high school even. Just to, just to add to that 1D there, high school was now a real thing by the mid-1800s, where previously almost nobody went to high school. The standard education before this time period was five years of school. So what is that? By the time you're 10, nine or 10, you're done. School's over and you're helping your family out on the farm. High school becomes a real thing for the middle class and upper middle class to where you now go to school at least till, back in this time period, high school ended at 16. By 16, you were considered an adult and you needed to go out and start working or uh, working towards a family, getting some type of professional experience, being an intern or an apprentice to someone. You know, again, whether it's a farm or whether it's working in an accounting office, you needed to be by 16, you needed to be out there starting to prepare yourself to be an independent person. Well, this ties into the next section, the idea of self-made man. This was a notion that your work ethic could lead to success that your work ethic could lead to success, wealth, social mobility, status. And it was a real thing in this time period. It still is in America today, of course it is. You can start out what, penniless and work your way up the ladder to become very successful. Not easy to do. Um, today, the real way is education. You have to get an education and then you sort of slot yourself into society. They match you up with your educational degree and they'll slot you into a position. It isn't exactly working your way up these days. Now you work your way up the, the educational ladder, and then when you find yourself at the right point, you stop and you simply slot over into a job. Well, back then you had to start at the bottom because education really wasn't a big thing, uh, except for a very small percentage. So you had to work your way up the ladder through work ethic, through perseverance, hard work, ingenuity, entrepreneurship, willingness to take chances. Um, Hard work leading to success, hard work leads to social mobility, the idea of the self-made man. Uh, it's a real thing, uh, and it was, you really were given credit. Uh, you were really respected if you could start at the bottom and work your way up to the top. Benjamin Franklin published his autobiography in 1818, and his autobiography was really, was really focused on two things, being industrious and being independent. And if you were an industrious, independent person, you could be anything you wanted. Ben Franklin was. He started at the bottom. He was rich and wealthy uh, and then rose himself up to status of rich and wealth and status in America. 
This becomes really the central theme of American culture in the mid-1800s. Uh, the most respect given to anyone is the person who starts with nothing and ends with everything. Uh, previous times, the most respect was always given to the rich and wealthy families, the notable families. And much of that wealth you didn't actually earn, much of that wealth you, you would inherit from your family, from your father or something like that. So this really becomes very important. The idea of the common man working his way all the way to the top, from poor to the middle class, and even wealthy if you were intelligent and work hard enough. Um, this was an opportunity for all. This is one of the things that drew people to America. This idea of the ability to start at the bottom and work your way all the way up to the top. By this time period we're looking at here, um, about 50% of the white population was the laborers working for someone else. Wage labor. This was the wave of the future. This is what Thomas Jefferson ra railed against. Thomas Jefferson, his idea of agrarianism and agriculture in America, believing that was the future of America, his agrarian vision. Well, up to the 1820s, he was right. But after the 1820s, it changes. Uh, the wave of the future is, is wage labor, which is where we are in America today. Most people are wage laborers. And you have about 10% at the very bottom. These were people who worked in the most dangerous, temporary jobs, uh, often very, very poor wages, couldn't even cover the cost of food and rent. Uh, these were the people that were the worst off in society, this bottom 10%. And they also couldn't afford all the stuff they were making. That's a weird irony. They worked in the factories making these mass-produced goods, and this bottom 10% uh, couldn't even afford to purchase these goods. You know, in America in this time period, we're talking almost 50 million people. So 50 million people, bottom 10%. That is, do you realize how much that is? That's 5 million people. We're talking about millions of folks that, can't even guarantee they're going to have food at night. Uh, they have work of some sort. They're not, we're talking about homeless. They have some type of work, but they can't even guarantee they're going to have food to feed their kids or even worry about paying the rent at the end of the month. Millions and millions of people doing this. Um, their wages simply didn't cover the cost of living in America. Uh, they produced the factories. They worked in the factories. They produced the goods in the factories worked. And yeah, where'd they live? Well, if you worked in New, if you lived in New York, worked and lived in New York, well, this is the kind of place you live. This is a report from a New York government official. It's a quote. He saw gassed, he saw gaunt, shivering people with wild, ghastly faces living among hideous squalor, deadly air, the dim, undrained courts. Courts is sort of the middle area of a housing unit, sort of the open area in the middle. The dim, undrained courts oozing with pollution, trash. Remember, this is before most of there wasn't really trash collection. So people would just dump their waste out on the street. Oozing with pollution, dark, narrow stairways, decayed with age, reeking with filth, overrun of vermin. Vermin, that's rats. Um, this is what it was living in these tenement housing in New York City. This is where the workers lived. It was, it was hell. It really was. It was miserable, it was filthy, it was dirty, it was disgusting, filled with disease, um, pollution. Terrible, terrible, uh, terrible the way it was. Um, children worked at an incredibly young age. Uh, this is referring there to 1A. Um, it was common for children in the cities to start working as young as age eight. <clears throat> uh, child labor was common practice. In this time period, uh, if, you, if you look at both city and farm life, 80% of all kids worked. Now, if you worked on the farm, you were watched over by your parents because you worked right there alongside mom or dad. So there was a certain safety in that. You know, mom and dad's going to make sure you don't get your arm cut off or something, uh, if possible. But when you worked in the cities, which was about a third of all kids worked in the cities, there was no one looking after you. You worked in these factories, these child labor, these were sweatshops. It was it was practically slave labor. It really was. Housing conditions were terrible. Working conditions were terrible. Child labor. Yeah. And this is what immigrants found when they came to America. The reason these cities fill up, New York, Chicago, Boston, places like this fill up with millions of people, 
is because when they get off the ship, that's where they find. That's the first place they find. And they're, that's the first place they're able to find work and shelter. And they take what they can get. And what they get is pretty miserable, frankly. Another real problem was alcohol. What's one of the reasons people drink? To forget their problems. Uh, socially and to forget their problems. So the cities have millions of people. So lots of social situations. Combine that with miserable life, miserable work conditions, uh, miserable housing. You drink to forget it. You find solace in rum and beer. You forget all of your pains of life. Drink away all your miseries. From the 1820s and 1830s, we see a massive increase in alcohol availability in America. Previously, rum was the number one alcohol. Well, in the 1820s, we start seeing increasing numbers of German immigrants. And what did they bring with them? They brought their beer. 1840s, we see a large number of Irish immigrants. What did they bring with them? Their beer and their alcohol-making productions. So many of the immigrants bought, brought with them a tradition of alcohol production and their, again, this their ingenuity. Uh, you had the Sellers family building industrial factories, making wire sieves. You have Irish families building uh, distilleries. German families doing the same thing, building breweries. So they show up with this and drinking is so common. People drank during the workday all day long. Now, the beer was a lot less alcohol back then. Uh, today, I think an average alcohol content in a beer is like five or six percent, something like that. Back then, the average alcohol content was about one, one and a half percent. So you could literally drink beer all day long, especially if you were used to it, and you would never really get intoxicated. You just have a beer, just drink beer like people drink soda today, and you would never really get drunk. Although the whole time you're just slightly inebriated. Um, it made life easier because it was so miserable. And I'm sure lots of health problems, of course. Uh, livers being destroyed, of course. Um, rum and beer were consumed so often all through the day. Uh, usually 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. is when they would stop and have breaks, and they would go and they would eat something and they would drink. Probably one of the reasons you had a lot of workplace violence and injuries. Uh, yeah, I mean, people are drinking all the time. Uh, while alcohol doesn't make people violent, we do know that intoxication makes you less inhibited, which means you're more likely to not control your temper or more likely to act on simply irration or, or passions. So having everybody drunk all the time, of course, increases the incidence of violence, workplace injuries, all this kind of stuff. Um, and there really wasn't police, very limited police force in most of these cities. Even if it wasn't the Wild West, on the streets of the cities, it was pretty much take care of yourself. It was uh, each man for himself. It really was that way. So alcohol was a huge problem among the poor. Uh, not to mention, we haven't even mentioned the fact that they're spending their money they don't have. Uh, they're spending money they don't have on alcohol because they're so miserable trying to forget how terrible their life is. Uh, that makes their life even worse because they don't have money now. The drunkard's progress. This ties into the next section. The next section, which is about Christian reform and benevolence, which means benevolence between really helping, helping people. Uh, this is an image from this and I'll show you what, what we call it, the Benevolent Empire. This is a Christian movement. Benevolent Empire is this Christian movement by religious leaders to correct all the ills of society. So it's this movement by Christian leaders to try and address and correct all the sins and ills, uh, sometimes use the word vices, to correct all the vices of society. So an image the Benevolent Empire would use would be this, the Drunkard's Progress. So a good man here dressed in nice attire. Those are some pants, aren't they? Those are crazy. Uh, dressed in nice, appropriate attire, has a few drinks. Then he has a couple extra drinks because it's cold and the alcohol makes you feel warm inside. It actually does the opposite. It actually cools your body, but it makes you feel warmer. Uh, then you have a glass too much and you're drunk. Then step four is you're drunk and riotous. You're getting in trouble. You're getting into bar fights. Uh, you're going to get, you're going to hurt each other. Then the summit attained. Jolly companions, you are a confirmed drunkard. You're drinking all the time. You're going out every night. You're being foolish. Then we quickly move to step six. I think how step five goes to step six is pretty quick. Now you're dealing with poverty and disease. You're forsaken by all those friends. 
You're homeless. You're living on the street. Your life is destroyed. Now suddenly you're dressed well again. I'm not so sure how, how you went from from basically those type of clothing in seven to eight. I guess you you're you're a criminal, so you stole your clothes or you 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 robbed people and now you could buy nice clothes. And then of course step nine, you kill yourself. So you go from step one, where you have a drink of, of wine or a drink of uh, rum or beer with your friends, and then a few short steps later, you're blowing your head off with a gun. This might be a little dramatic, a little um, a little over dramatic, maybe, but it makes the point that the benevolent empire believed alcohol, straight, very clear, alcohol was the root of all evils. The benevolent empire had that as a foundational belief. Christian leaders had it as a foundational belief. The root of all evil was alcohol in America's cities. So that explains this image better, does it not? Because evil, one of the most evil things you can do is to rob, murder, kill, suicide. And then, of course, what about the middle of the picture? When you do all this, what happens? Who do you really hurt? Not just yourself, not just innocent people by being a criminal or violent, murderous, not just yourself, you also hurt your wife and kids. Because the assumption is you're a family man. And for being a family man, you're now a criminal, you're homeless, you are killing yourself, and what do you do, who do you really hurt? You leave your wife and your child out in the cold. Literally. Uh, the house is burning down over here, the house is destroyed, they lost everything, life is over, and where are they gonna go? They're gonna go to the poor house over here. They're going to have to go to the poor house, one of those uh, factories they're going to have to work. Uh, and this little, your little six-year-old girl is going to be working in a textile factory now, which was actually, which actually did happen, of course. Uh, so that's what you get. That leads us into the Benevolent Empire. And their number one attack was on alcohol, alcohol consumption. Um, these were actions taken by religious leaders to perform all the ills, to, to reform fix all the ills of society, this conservative social reform. Now, the leaders were usually congregational Presbyterian ministers. They led these organizations focused on some issues like um, uh, alcohol consumption, or the word we would use would be temperance. Temperance, which means limiting or stopping alcohol consumption. So they focused on temperance. They see if I have it really focused on prostitution. Um, uh, women prostitutes. We know that some women chose prostitution. For almost all of world history, the best paying job a woman could get was as a prostitute. Uh, put it this way, you could work all day long and make $3 for a full day, 12, 14, 16 hours of work, and you might make a couple dollars. Prostitutes made a dollar for every John they were with. So they could make $5 in an hour versus 16 hours of work of making two bucks. So the best paying job a prostitute could make would be, a best paying job a woman could get would be prostitution. So women chose it. However, a lot of women did not. A lot of women were in forced sexual slavery and they did not choose prostitution. And there's even another way to look at it. If you are forced to be a prostitute because of your economic situation, even though you choose it, are you really choosing it? Because you're being forced into it by your economic status. You can't feed your kids or take care of your family, and yet you, you don't have a man, although, truth be told, some married women were prostitutes as well to support the family. Um, uh, many, most of them would have been single women. Uh, you have to provide for your children and your family if you're widowed or you simply are unmarried. So you choose prostitution. But again, it's sort of coerced choosing. However they get into it, the benevolent empire was, was focused on getting women out of prostitution, believing, of course, it was, was against the Bible and it was unchristian to do it. But even for other reasons, not as altruistic. Good men would go to prostitutes. Family men that had families would go to prostitutes. So one of the ways you keep them from going to prostitutes is get rid of the prostitutes. So don't think that all this is real true benevolence and altruism. A lot of the focus of the benevolent empire was because these things actually dragged down middle class society. So it wasn't as moralistic and as, as, as on the up and up as it sounds. They had ulterior motives, some of them, that it was really also about improving the upper class 
uh, at the expense of the lower class or without regard for the lower class. Adultery, of course, is a problem. Cheating, again, that's a religious thing, a moral thing. Uh, crime, of course. Uh, who did crime affect? A crime affected the middle class because who had things to steal? The middle class. So this isn't all altruistic. Some of it certainly was. Some of it was certainly directly designed to benefit and help the poor, but a lot of it was also designed and benefit to help the middle class and protect them from the poor in addition. Uh, this wasn't just about sermons though. They actually did a lot of outreach. The ABS was the American Bible Society. Uh, the ATS was the American Temperance Society. The Bible Society actually handed out thousands, hundreds of thousands of Bibles all over the place, all over America. This also connected rural and urban. Many of these societies went across the whole country, not just in the cities. They, they went out to rural farming communities. They went out to the frontier. And of course, they focused on cities and immigrants as well. This wasn't just sermons. They actually went out and created these societies. They would have meetings. They would have clubs, organizations to actually help local communities and help people try and uh, right their life, sort of right the ship, try to get away from these different vices and be good, moral, Christian Americans. They often encourage discipline and they encourage regular habits. Um, many of them didn't go so far as to say you couldn't drink, to prohibit drinking. They didn't go that far because alcohol consumption was very common among the upper classes as well. Alcohol was often associated with high class living. High class people drank alcohol, uh, sherry and wine and things like this. So it wasn't about completely prohibiting many of these vices, but about limiting them, about having regular habits. Because many of the rich and upper class simply would not have gone with it if you said we have to uh, prohibit alcohol completely. They would not have supported the benevolent empire with donations, money, charity. The benevolent empire was largely supported by wealthy people that gave money. Um, think like church outreach today. How does the church do all their outreach? By donations, by tithes. Uh, by all the parishioners and local businesses giving them money, and then they use that money to uh, do outreach to the community, to the poor and homeless, and, and do service, social services. Well, you're not going to get that assistance if you're telling people they can't do things. Well, there was some pushback to this. One, Sundays, they really wanted people to go to church. That was the holy day, the religious day. Your average working person, working class person, works six days a week. What day do they have off? Sunday. That was the game day. That was the day when you relaxed. You had fun, leisure activities, spent it with your family. The rise of sports in America happens in the mid-1800s. We start having different types of sporting events. Uh, baseball appears in the mid-1800s, for instance. It's not an organized sport yet, but there are other types of sports. Boxing was big. Uh, animal fighting was unfortunately a popular thing as well. Chicken fights, dog fights, um, other types of sporting events. So Sunday was when you did it. And we had the Benevolent Empire saying, nope, Sunday is a day to spend with your family, go to church and worship God. You shouldn't be doing all this other, act. you shouldn't be drinking, you shouldn't be partying, you shouldn't be hanging out with your friends. You need to focus on the family and focus on spirituality. A lot of people had a problem with this, especially the upper classes. Uh, well, you know, that would be wrong to say. All classes really had a problem with this. Everybody seemed to have an issue with this. Um, yeah, uh, they, there is one positive aspect of the whole Sunday thing. They do really get American businesses away from working on Sunday. Sundays become the day when most businesses close. And this is really under pressure from Benevolent Empire. It's the holy day. You shouldn't work on that day. So workers are probably happy about that. Now, most people aren't working on Sundays by the mid-1800s. But instead of having it for a game-free day, now they're supposed to attend church and spend all day with their family. Um, they also campaigned for laws, actually trying to get the laws changed to make it illegal to play games or have festivals on Sundays to where you could only spend it with your family or the church. Now, many people thought this was a big problem. After all, we're supposed to be a free country, right? You're supposed to be able to do what you want. You go to work, you choose to go to work. 
If you go to church, you should choose to go to church. Well, the Benevolent Empire didn't really see it that way. They believed their, their belief in a strong Christian, ethical, moral America was for the greater good of all. You shouldn't really have a choice. You should be required to go to church on Sundays. And so lots of resistance to this, especially in the North. All based on the idea of American republicanism, freedom, equality. Uh, we're free thinkers. We have the one day off. We should have the principles of America's founding say that we should not be forced to have certain moral beliefs. Again, it's in the Constitution, religious freedom. You should have the option of going to church. You should have the option of what you worship or what you choose to do. This is really about American republicanism. And this is nothing to do with political party. This is the idea of the republic has freedom and equality for all. Now, we know that is not true, um, especially if you're a minority immigrant woman. That isn't the case. But the ideal is still there, this ideology. And this ideology rears its head during this, and it really becomes an important uh, social focus of, while most people agree with Benevolent Empire's ideas, most of it is for the betterment of society, and most people sort of buy into it. Sunday is incredibly controversial, and that is a controversy to the point where many, many places actually pass laws prohibiting almost anything occurring on Sunday that was non-religious. Now, in the South, these were more, these were generically referred to as these blue laws. I don't even know where that comes from, the blue, but the idea being that almost everything was prohibited. Working, having any type of alcohol, any type of leisure activities, almost everything was prohibited on Sunday except for religion. So freedom of religion only went so far. Religious tolerance only went so far. On Sunday, many people in the Benevolent Empire didn't want it to be that way. You, in essence, were being forced. And yes, they even used terminology like being a slave uh, to a slave to Christianity. And they were worried about slaves being Christianized, slaves in both ways, that you were being forced by Christian moral rules to do certain things. That is the idea of slaves. And further, they were concerned about slaves actually being Christianized in this time period. It should be noted that by the 1860s, most slaves are Christian. But in the 1820s, when the Benevolent Empire really starts to take off, most slaves are not Christian. Most slave owners were against Christianizing slaves because the implication was if they were Christians, you had to treat them better. You had to treat them more fairly. And then, of course, the moral quandary, eh, should we be enslaving other Christians? That's a real problem in the early 1800s for Southerners to get over. That's a hump that they have a hard time passing, and that's why they don't want slaves Christianized. Well, by the mid-1800s, they completely get past it and overlook it, and it's not a big deal at all. They, they, they moralize and they, um, they rationalize. Slaves are slaves. doesn't matter if they're Christian or not. Uh, slavery is about race. Uh, if you're black, you're, you're a slave person. You should be treated as a slave, regardless of your religion. And they even go so far as to believe that they're doing slaves a service. They're helping slaves by Christianizing them. So you go in one generation, 1820, you can't Christianize slaves because it's unchristian to enslave other Christians. So by the 1860s, oh, we're doing them a service and Christianizing them, we're saving their souls. They're still going to be slaves, uh, but when they die, at least they're going to go to heaven. Uh, but here in the mortal world, we're going to keep them as slaves. That was the amazing thing about Southern slave society. No matter what problems they had to overcome, uh, Southern slave owners and masters, no matter what types of social moral quandaries they had to deal with, they always found a way to rationalize and justify. Oh, it's okay. Uh, we're going to, Christian, slavery is in the Bible. There were Christians who were slaves. We're going to continue to enslave them, but we'll just Christianize them and then we'll save their soul. Uh, we're taking care of them. Yeah, yeah, um, interesting, this, how Southerners did this. Nonetheless, um, immigration and cultural conflict, I believe, is this our last section? Um, yeah, this is our last section in the chapter. Immigration and cultural conflict. Most immigrants from the 40s to the 60s, 
uh, over 4 million immigrants from 1840 to 1860, 4 million immigrants came into the country, mostly Irish, German, and English. Irish, German, and English. Most of them avoided the South. Uh, Ireland, England, and Germany had really either outlawed slavery or they didn't, um, they looked down upon slavery. So slavery wasn't really an issue. It's a weird irony. The slave trade was almost entirely conducted and facilitated by Europeans, uh, in the Western world at least. And yet, Europe didn't really have slavery. Uh, but they instituted slavery across all their colonies. Anyway, uh, so people that came from Europe really avoided the slave South for both reasons. They wanted nothing to do with slavery. Plus, in the slave South, the slaves had did all the labor or the majority of the labor. Therefore, if you were a poor white, you had lots of competition for all the, all the labor jobs. So if you wanted a paying labor job in the South, you had to compete with slaves that, I mean, how'd you compete? They don't even get paid. And so that means you were going to get paid very little for doing work equivalent to a slave. No one wanted to be equated to a slave. No one wanted to be paid very little. Um, and of course, a lot of these were Protestants and Catholics. And as I said, in Europe, where slavery didn't really exist anymore, many religious people simply were against slavery on religious grounds, believing slavery was improper. Uh, by the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, we were one of the largest industrial countries in the world, one of the only large industrial countries in the world that still had slavery. For obvious reasons, it was, it was such a big part of our economy. Plus, many people wanted jobs in manufacturing, and the South didn't have manufacturing jobs. There was only a handful of cities in the South, with Atlanta, Mobile, New Orleans. There was only a handful of large cities, uh, Charleston. And so most industrialized manufacturing factory jobs were in the North. Or if you wanted to be an independent farmer, you didn't go to the South or the North, you went to the West. You went out to the West and found your own independent farm somewhere in the Central or Western United States. What did most of them end up becoming? Poor urban settlers. Most of them became poor urban settlers. Um, many of these migrants were incredibly poor. Uh, Irish potato famines in the 1840s, they came over here. Uh, industrialization of farming in Germany in the 1840s and 50s in Europe. They come over here. So many of them spent their last penny to get aboard the ship. They come here with no money, no prospects, limited or no education. So most of them end up working in these, uh, living in the squalor and the terrible living conditions we talked about in um, the cities in those tenement houses and those those terrible housing conditions working for very low wages in the factories that's where most of them most settle in new, new england region the new york region uh that northeast corridor up there where most industrialization was living in terrible squalor um uh, a large number of these were irish catholics uh, a couple million irish catholics we see irish catholics really building up communities um, uh, building up communities with all of the, I don't say accoutrements of home, but all of the stability of home. They build large neighborhoods, which have Irish Catholic churches. They have Irish Catholic schools, political organizations, um, pol uh, industri industrial factories, industrial shops that only hired Irish Catholic people charitable societies, uh, newspapers, all catering to Irish Catholics and Irish people. Um, this is often the way it worked. Germans did the same thing. Italians did the same thing. Uh, English did the same thing. They would form these communities that often people spoke the same language, had the same ethnicity, had the same religion, dressed the same, talked the same. It isn't that they didn't want to assimilate, but they, they found safety and security among people who look the same, talk the same. Of course, you'd have a higher probability of finding work as well. If you're Irish Catholic and you go to an Irish Catholic neighborhood, you're probably going to have a better chance of finding housing and employment as well. Well, they had to often deal with a great deal of nativism. Nativism, it's a really interesting term. It refers to the Native Americans believing this was their country. Native Americans, Indians, 
No. This is not referring to Indians. This is referring to German Protestant descent. Protestant more generally. I get me make that more appropriate. English and German Protestant descent, which is the majority of Americans. Uh, the, the majority of Americans uh, are descended from English or German uh, ancestry. So uh, the vast majority of Americans, English or German ancestry. So they were the natives. That's what they called themselves. And we still deal with nativism today in America. It is the people born here versus immigrants. This has nothing to do with Native Americans. So natives believed that all of these immigrants coming in the country, whether they're foreign, new German peoples, new Irish peoples, uh, new Italians or whatever, they believed that they were going to perhaps take over the country, uh, dominate the country. Uh, really what causes most of this violence is the anti-sentiment, the anti-Catholic, the anti-German, the uh, anti-Italian sentiments really is what really generate most of this. Um, specifically dealing with the Irish here, we have an interesting issue. Samuel Morse writes this article, Foreign Conspiracy Against the Liberties of the United States. So at the same time, we have hundreds of thousands of Irish Catholics coming into America, into what most natives considered a Protestant nation. Well, we were, 90% of Americans were Protestant. So they consider this a Protestant nation. Irish Catholics are coming in. Then you have Samuel Morse arguing that all these new Irish Catholics will obey and only follow the orders of the Catholic Church, believing that they will do what the Catholic Church tells them to do and not obey the government of the U.S. This is patently false. There is no evidence that this is ever the case, that Irish Catholic people obey the laws any less than Protestants. No evidence at all. Nonetheless, what we what is most dangerous is fear, people having fear. And they fear these foreigners coming in that they might somehow endanger our Protestant-controlled America, which, by the way, doesn't happen. Our Protestant-controlled America is still very soundly Protestant-controlled to this very day. How many Catholic presidents have we had? Uno. One. Um, uh, most people in Congress, even today, are Protestant. Uh, the majority of Americans today are Protestant. So this idea 200 years ago that the Irish Catholics were going to take over America is laughable. Except, of course, many Protestant natives believed it. And if you believe it enough, whether there's any actual evidence, and for them there was evidence, Irish Catholics coming off the boat every day. To them, that's all the evidence they needed. If you believe it, you're going to act on it. And this is made worse by the fact that in the same time period, the actual Pope of the Catholic Church issues an announcement, a proclamation. I don't have the exact year of it. You can look it up. He issues a proclamation which says, in essence, an end to all freedom of speech in the world and all freedom of religion in Europe and condemns general liberty and says all people need to obey God and God's religious and sacred instructions above all else. So the Pope condemns, condemns liberty, condemns freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and says everybody in the world should be beholden to the words of the Catholic Christianity in the, the Catholic belief of God, the words of the Bible. Not the Protestant understanding, but the Catholic understanding. The Pope took a really hard line on this, and really, and he, he does this for very obvious reasons. Do the increasing attacks upon Catholic peoples in Europe, and Catholics are being persecuted all across Europe. Catholic people are being attacked and persecuted all across Europe. And furthermore, there was rising secularism in Europe, the same as in America, where more and more people were coming away from the church due to industrialization and the changing economics in Europe. Bottom line, when you're having to work every single day, all day long, just to try and put food on the table, you're less worried about religion. So people were too worried about economics because they had to be due to the fact that 75% of people in Europe were abjectly poor, uh, meaning they often couldn't even feed their families properly. 
uh, when you're worried about that, you're not worried about God. You're simply worried about trying to take care of your families and not starve to death. So due to the numbers of people pulling away from religion, the large numbers of Catholic people immigrating to America, leaving Europe, and the persecution of Catholics, the Pope takes a very hard line and, and really trying to defend Catholic faith. And this happens around the same time many people in America are worried about Catholics trying to take over or influence our society. And, um, well, that made it really bad for the Irish. We see increasing violence, increasing attacks, increasing conflict, murders of Irish people in the streets. Literally, if you were an Irish person, you did not go roaming around New York in any Protestant neighborhoods. You would be knifed. You would be knifed and murdered on the street. They would they would drag you, a mob would drag you into an alley, and if you were a woman, you'd be raped and murdered. And if you're a man, you'd simply be beaten and then stabbed to death. Simply for being Irish. How do they know you're Irish? It's pretty obvious, actually. In this time period, people often dressed, uh, having to do with their people and their culture. So you could tell by the way people dressed. You could tell literally by the hats they wore. German Protestants wore certain types of hats. So you could tell by the hats they wore, the clothes, their accents their look, the color of their hair. If you were Irish Catholic, it was almost impossible to hide it. It was obvious. Um, yeah, uh, violence and murder and, and all this was really, really common. Uh, the image you're gonna see here in this image right here, these riots in Philadelphia, 1844. Here we have uh, Protestants um, with their hats. We have German Protestants. You have the military coming in trying to break it up. You have the German Protestants with their tall hats here. You have Irish Catholics. You have poor people being hurt. You have poor women and children being injured by this. So you have, this is a riot here between Catholics and Protestants and the Pennsylvania State Militia. There's not even a regular police force. This is in Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania State Militia coming in trying to break down a riot in downtown. You have the militia marching in back here with their weapons trying to break up this massive fight between German Protestants and Irish Catholics, murdering each other in the streets. Common. This is a real deal. I mean, if you went anywhere in, in many of these cities, you had to go in crowds with many other people because by yourself, you'd get attacked, mobbed, raped, or murdered. Really, really common. Uh, 1840s and 1850s was really tumultuous time period. Uh, if anyone's seen that movie, which is an excellent movie, it's actually very historical historically accurate, Gangs of New York. It's probably maybe almost 20 years old now. Leonardo DiCaprio, um, uh, Cameron Diaz, I think was in it. Uh, excellent movie, excellent movie. The end of the movie takes place around 1863. Uh, and it's about these gangs. The movie is exactly about what we're talking about. German Protestant gangs and Irish Catholic gangs trying to control the streets of New York's in a region known as Five Points. It's a real place in central New York to where five different neighborhoods came into close contact. And they often had all this disagreement and all this fighting, literally killing in the streets. And the end of the movie is during the American Civil War, and they have a massive riot, which did really occur in downtown New York, that the United States military had to actually come in and break up. Very much like the image you see here happening in Philadelphia, only it happened 19 years later. It's a real thing, 1863. They really were associated with draft riots because the American Civil War, they were forcing people to join the military in 1863 uh, to go and fight in the war over slavery. And people didn't want to go fight. And you overlay that with the animosity and the hatred between the Protestants and the Catholics, and you end up with a massive brawl that that actual battle that occurred at the Five Points in 1863, hundreds of people were killed or injured right there in the streets, just murdered in the streets. Uh, the U.S. Army had actually come in and start firing cannons to break up the crowds. This is pretty crazy. Just crazy murder in the streets just over different ethnicity and religious beliefs. Anyway. So it gives you an idea of how, how, how life was like in the urban cities of America, industrialized cities of America. Uh, you wouldn't want to live there. Not really. Uh, and yet millions did. That ends our chapter. Uh, that ends our chapter here for chapter nine. I appreciate you going through it with me and watching it. And I hope you learned something from it. Take care.